We next discuss weighting methods. Weighting method is a generalization of matching methods to improve covariate balance. Let's think about the potential limitations of matching methods. Uh, the first, it could be very inefficient. Uh, it may throw away too many uh, observations but, and end up reducing the sample size. It could also be ineffective. It may not be able to balance covariates because the matching method, um, it, all you can do is either keep the um, observation or throw away. And in addition, let's remember that the matching is really a special case of weighting. We already written the matching estimator, any matching estimator, as, um, as a weighting estimator, right? So I've shown you that um, for, for every control unit, it's going to receive some weights, uh, which is proportional to the number of times it get matched to uh, a treated units. So essentially the idea of matching estimator is that of the weighting estimator where we're going to be weighting each observation in the control group di differently, right? Because the treatment group and control groups are very different. So we're going to adjust the control groups by weighting some pro uh, observations more than others, such that the control group will look like the treatment group and achieve the group covariate balance. So this is just to emphasize that uh, matching is really um, a special form of weighting where the weights are sort of integer um, constructed weights. So the basic idea of weighting uh, is, uh, is the use of inverse probability of treatment weighting, IPW. Okay? It comes from, the idea comes from the weighting for surveys. In the surveys, we uh, we often downweight the oversample respondents so that the sample, the people you interviewed, uh, look like the population of interest, target population. So if you end up having too many older respondents than in the population, you will downweight those older population. The way to do it is to use the sampling weights, uh, which is inversely proportional to the sampling probability. So the weights are inversely proportional to the sum probability. And so the uh, one on the uh, estimator that people use is Horvitz-Thompson estimator, which basically weight each uh, outcome y as, as a probability um, in, uh, where the weights are inversely proportional to probability of being sampled. So the higher, the more likely you are to be in the sample, the smaller your know, weight is going to be. Okay, so here the n is the population size in the finite population framework, and si is the sampling indicator. So si equal one if you're being sampled, si equal zero if you're not being if you're not in sample. And you want to use uh, compute the uh, the average sample average by uh, weighting inversely proportional to the sampling probability. Okay. So we can use this idea uh, for uh, treatment effect estimation. So the reason is that you can think of the treatment assignment indicator as a sampling indicator. Right? So if the t equal 1, you're going to be sampling observing y of 1 for that observation, okay. uh, for, 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 that, for those units. Um, if t equals 0, then you'll be observing y of zero for those units. Okay. So, and if someone is more likely to be in the treatment group, when you're estimating um, ex expected value of y of one, you need to downweight those observations. If someone is unlikely to be in the treatment group, but happen to be in the treatment group, then those observations need to be upweighted. So here in the observational studies, you're going to estimate the propensity score uh, conditional probability of receiving achievement given xi, and then use that as a weighting procedure. Right? So it's completely analogous to the Hobbes Thompson estimator in the survey context setting, where in the treatment group it would be weighted inversely proportional to the propensity score, and in the control group it will be weighted um, inversely proportional to 1 minus propensity score. 
Okay, so that this is the estimate of average stream impact. We can do a similar weighting scheme for average stream impact for the treated. In this case, it turns out the weights are going to be uh, propensity score divided by one minus propensity score, and then similarly for the average stream uh, effect for the control. Okay, so just different weighting scheme. Um, if the propensity score is identical, then it becomes it reduces to the difference in means estimator. So uh, difference in means estimator, in a sense, is a special case of this inverse probability of treatment weighting, where there's no weighting is necessary because everybody has the same probability of uh, receiving the treatment. Often the problem of the um, weighting method is that weights can be very extreme. So imagine a case where the treatment, uh, the propensity score is really small. Then, because the weight is one over propensity score, the, the weight that observation receives is going to be very, very big. So one way to stabilize those weights is something called the no, uh, is, is uh, normalizing those weights. This comes from the idea in the survey sampling when the population size is unknown. When the population is size in, is unknown, you can use something called Hayek estimator, where you see that in the denominator is basically the um, sum of the uh, weights. Okay, because here the weights is SI uh, over probability of SI equal one. So uh, the denominator is basically giving you the sum of the weights. So it, it, it normalizes um, by dividing it uh, each weight by the sum of the weights. Okay, so that the weights sum to one. Um, so that's a Hayek estimator is often used. So this is useful in the survey sampling context when the population size is unknown because there is the probability of um, SI equal one can be calculated without knowing the um, population size because they appear in both in numerator and denominator so they cancel each other. So you only need to know the probability up to the proportional uh, to the constant. Um, the one downside of this is the weights are normalized but no longer biased um, because now the um, random variable SI is in the denominator. However, one would hope that uh, variance gain that, um, that results from the use of this normalization outweighs small biases that might be induced. So in the uh, context of causal inference, we can do the same thing. So we can divide by the weights, the uh, sum of the weights, uh, which appears here in the denominator for both treated and control observations. Okay? So we can normalize the weights so that weights are um, less extreme. Um, weighted least squares does this automatically. Okay? So the weighted least squares um, in the least squares, the weights are only given proportional to the constant. So the, if you do the weighted least squares, um, you can get this automatically. Okay. So typically, normalizing a weight is a good thing. Now, this may not completely solve the problem if the weights are so extreme. In those cases, small number observations can uh, account for most of the uh, samples, uh, most of the weights and the effective sample size uh, reduces dramatically. So often people will trim the weights, um, removing extreme weights, observations with, ex uh, removing ex extreme weights by adjusting it to some, um, you know, smallest uh, or largest weights you, you, you're allowed to um, use. So for example, you may say, okay, I'm only allowed the weights to, you know, be up to 20, 20 times more than the equal weights case. What about the variance? Uh, so the one nice thing about the weighting formulation when you're estimating these propensity scores is that we can think of the IPW estimator as the method of moments estimator. So remember the method, method of moments estimator it's basically you have moment conditions, moment equality, and then you try to solve it um, to get the parameter estimates. Okay, so that's basically the very general 
uh, methodology, method of moments estimator, very popular in econometrics. And nice thing is that if you can write the estimator as a method of moments estimator, then all the asymptotic uh, property is can be easily uh, available. So for example, when you're estimating a propensity score, you can think of that estimation as a moment condition problem. So here is, um, this is a score function, score condition, the first order condition for maximum likelihood estimation of pi, the propensity score model. So if you're running the logistic regression, it will fit in that, uh, it, will, it, will, it will be, you'll be solving this equation to obtain the propensity score. And you can combine this moment condition with moment condition from the weighting estimator. So the Horvitz-Thompson, uh, you can think of this as a uh, moment condition. Uh, mu1 and mu0 is the parameter you're trying to solve. And you have um, pi, which is the propensity score indexed by the parameters theta. So now you have two sets of um, moment conditions one from the propensity score model, the one above, and then the other from the IPW estimator, both has the parameter theta as a function of it, and then the mu is the quantity of interest, and you can solve this uh, moment condition and asymptotic um, standard errors are readily available. Uh, Hayek uh, estimator can be also, you can construct the moment estimator and um, what's nice about this is that once you have, you once you use um, propensity score model to uh, estimate the weights, uh, unlike matching case, we can basically put this into a nice standard method of moment estimator framework. Okay. Now, if the propensity score model is correctly specified. Um, it's been shown that these variances are smaller than those with a true propensity score. So this is an interesting result where the estimated propensity score gives you better efficiency than the true uh, propensity score. Reason being that um, it accounts for some of the sampling variabilities that exist in the data. So you get, you learn, um, you learn more information from the data than just specifying the true propensity score. Now, of course, if the model is incorrectly specified, uh, the resulting estimate tor might be biased and the efficiency gain is not going to be um, necessarily existent. So the question is, okay, what we do um, when uh, there is a possibility that the propensity score model is misspecified? In particular, some people may argue that why don't we just run the regression approach because correctly specifying the model for propensity score may be as difficult as correctly specifying the model for the outcome model, right? So in the regression approach, if you estimate the regression function of y given t and x, then assuming the, you know, the overlap condition and unconfoundedness assumptions hold, we can correctly estimate average streaming effect using a, a formula that we studied in the, uh, in the lecture on regression. Here, um, we don't have to model the outcome, but we still have to get model the propensity score, so streaming given x, which may not be, um, you know, which is as high dimensional as the outcome model. Outcome model, you have to model y given t and x. Here, you have to model t given x, right? So in some sense, it's it's a difficult to model uh, the treatment assignment as to model the outcome. Uh, you might have a little bit more information about the, how the treatment assignment uh, is done in practice. So you may have more information about, you know, the better chance of correctly specifying the propensity score. Nevertheless, it is a difficult task and the misspecification of the probability score could lead to the bias. One um, estimator that addresses uh, this issue is something called W robust estimator, uh, was developed by uh, Jamie Robbins and his colleagues. And the idea is augment IPW estimator. Um, 
with the, the following function. So here is the expression for W the box estimator. Now, if you compare this with the usual IPW estimator, the red part is the IPW estimator. So you see that for each treated and control group, there is additional term. So for the treatment group, for example, ti minus pi hat over pi hat times mu hat. Right? Here, the mu hat is the regression function. So here, you're running the regression function for the treatment group, regression model for the treatment group for the outcome, and that gives you a mu hat one. You're also running the regression model for the control group, which gives you mu hat zero. Okay, And we are augmenting IPW with that regression function you estimated from using the outcome data times some um, some function uh, some function of the propensity score, right? So suppose uh, propensity score is correct. Okay, so suppose you got the propensity score correctly estimated, then the IPW give you a consistent estimator for average stream impact. Okay, so what what we like to do in that situation is the second term to go away. Okay. Now, if you look at the second term and take expectation of it and conditional on x, you see that a numerator of that fraction is going to be 0 because the, um, because the propensity score is correctly specified. Expected value of ti given x is going to be uh, the same as pi of x. Okay, so as long as the pi is consistently estimated, the second term goes away. In a similar um, way, the, the additional term in the control group also goes away. So if the so this shows that the W robust estimator is consistent for average streaming effect so long as the propensity score model is correctly specified. Now, what about if the propensity score model is incorrect? but the regression estimator is correct. You can rewrite this whole expression in the following way. Okay. So here, if the regression model is correct, then mu hat 1 and mu minus mu hat 0 gives you the right estimator. So this is the regression estimator we um, discussed a couple of weeks ago. Now, what about the second additional term that we have here? Now, the propensity score model is incorrect, so who knows what the pi hat is going to converge to. But in the numerator, again, you have y minus mu hat 1. Okay? And in the below, you have y minus mu hat 0. So again, if you take expectation conditional expectation y, conditional on t and x, then that's a residual. So that's going to be equal to 0. So in expectation, the second term, again, um, asymptotically goes to 0. Right? So what this shows is that W robust estimator is correct as long as one of the two models, either the propensity score model or the outcome model, regression model, is correct. And you don't even have to know which one is correct. Right? So, so this sort of saw, uh, addresses the dilemma we had, whether we should go with the regression modeling approach or the propensity score modeling approach. Because in either of these two approaches, if you get the model incorrectly specified, um, then you get the wrong answer. But here, this W robust estimator allows you to estimate the average human effect consistently so long as one of the two uh, models is correct. Okay, so you get two chances to be correct. Um, it also has been shown, at, and there's a big literature on the efficiency of this type of estimator. It's shown that it gives the smallest asymptotic variance among estimators that are consistent when the propensity score model is correct. So this is sort of, with this double robustness property, uh, this estimator, this form of the estimator, gives you the smallest asymptotic variance. So it's as efficient as possible given this uh, attractive property of double robustness.